All right, y'all, we are here for a conversation. Now, I want to say, we have leaders now that are fighting for our democracy and civil rights on the stage. We got leaders that are fighting for gun violence prevention on the stage. We got leaders that are fighting for reproductive freedom for all on the stage. And we're going to keep it all the way real tonight, okay? Jada Pinkett and the Red Table Talk ain't got nothing on us, oh, okay? Oh, man, I don't know if I was There's ready some entanglements in Congress all we'll right. have to talk about. All right. <laughs> so I just want to have a conversation with y'all. I think especially being movement leaders in the field in some of the most volatile topics of our time, this work is hard. And I think the hardest question anyone ever asks me is, how are you? Uh, that's a dreadful question. It's dreadful. <laughs> so tell me, when people ask you that, how are you, and they're asking you to make sense of the last couple of years, what do you even tell them? My pronouns are she, her, exhausted, and outraged. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I'm going to just say, I think that is the only way to be. If we are not tireless... We get tired, uh, but we are outraged enough that we work through the exhaustion because at the end of the day, this is a country sinking into authoritarianism on the backs of people of color, on the backs of people who ha uh, have the audacity to say that we get to choose our identity that we get to choose who we love, we get to choose whether or not we have a child or whether or not we use contraception, and have the audacity to say we should be seen as central to what makes this country great. Yeah, so that is a complicated question. When people say, how are you? Um, you know, the, the reality is exactly what you said. We're both exhausted, we're pissed off, we're fired up. That's what's gonna keep us moving forward towards what our goal is, what the, what the North Star is. But at the same time, I also have the audacity to have hope. And the reason that I have hope is that when I travel around this country, now Moms Demand Action has volunteers in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia. We're everywhere, y'all. And when I go and I meet with our volunteers and our young leaders across this country, it doesn't matter if I'm in a blue state, a red state, a purple state, people are done. They're fed up with the status quo when it comes to keeping our communities safe in this country. This is a leading cause of death for children, teens, and young adults. And that is something, when I go, for instance, I was in Nashville, they're not having it, and they're ready to roll up their sleeves. People that don't consider themselves joiners of things, they're not advocates of things. They might even think we're too left of something. But guess what? This is like the hard stop for them. So I'm hopeful because the majority of people are where we are. We just got to keep organizing and keep moving people forward, and I think we're going to make it. I mean, I'm tired. <laughs> I think we're all tired. But to piggyback on your point, I've had, about a year ago, I had a colleague in the repro movement call me pathologically optimistic. <laughs> and now I put it in my bio because I feel like it sums up a lot of my attitude. I mean, look, we have 22 states with abortion bans. We are fighting an incredibly, increasingly extremist field um, of opponents to our fundamental freedoms, and it's well beyond abortion. It's, you know, medication abortion. It's birth control. Um, it's so many fundamental things. What makes me optimistic, pathologically, is the people. You know, I get energized by being in rooms like this and talking to folks like y'all and being in coalition and solidarity with y'all. We've never seen this kind of collaboration before, right? 
Like, reproductive freedom voters are democracy voters, are gun violence prevention voters, and are firmly with the LGBTQ plus community, 100%. Right. Yeah, that's right. And it's a new clarity for our folks, right? Our opponents are the same. That dark money fueling those movements, it's the same. And we figured it out. We're in solidarity, but more importantly, we're being very strategic and smart in our organizing work. I know we're gonna talk more about that. That makes me very optimistic in dark times. Yes, yes. We need optimism in dark times. Wait, you have to answer the question, Kelly. Oh. Yeah. How are you, Kelly? Oh, she's leaning back. She's leaning Man. back. You know, <laughs> I think normally my, my posture in the world is one of, uh, you know, rainbow colored glasses, right? Like I just see all of the hope and opportunity. But lately I've been thinking that it's also important to hold the grief and the pain and not look away too quickly. Because that reminds us of what it actually is that we're fighting for and what we're fighting against. And in this moment, the contrast between what progressive leaders are fighting for and our opposition is so extreme. The ways that they're willing to dehumanize our lives, the ways that they're willing to come for our children, I don't ever wanna forget the depths of evil that they've put on main stages like GOP debates that are happening right now. And I don't want to forget that because then it reminds me that our work right now, and I felt this a lot after the fall of Roe v. Wade when you know, we were in the reproductive rights movement, is to do all that we can to hold the, lo the line and the rights and protections that we fought for for the last 10 years, the last 40 years, the last 400, but to not be so trapped by them that we can't envision what liberation That's should right. look like and feel like if we are actually to be free. That's right, 100%. I wanna come back to what Minnie was talking about though with intersectionality and our opposition. Look. When I was listening to Ron DeSantis attack us, but so fluidly go from talking about LGBTQ plus history and also banning the study of black history in schools, I said, was he reading Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw? Yeah. <laughs> they know intersectionality. They are launching an intersectional attack. So talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing about our intersectional response. It's like the upside down Kimberly Crenshaw, right? <laughs> like, I don't even know, that hurts my brain, uh, but you're right. Um, what we're seeing is that they are not stupid. This is important. I was on a panel yesterday in California with some young leaders, and we were talking about outreach across the aisle, and across the board, every one of them said, we know that the Republicans we're dealing with aren't stupid. They're actually pretty sophisticated. They're making pretty sophisticated arguments. And sometimes our side makes the mistake of assuming these are all hicks or these are all just bigots. I mean, yes, they are bigots. But they're drawing a very incredibly smart line in their own communities between movements. And the basis of all of this is exciting fear to exert power and control, right? That's what they want. That's the root of white supremacy. And they know that if they attack all of us collectively, strategically, they can shock and awe, they can exhaust us, they can terrify us, particularly by going after our children, and they can align their side together around the range of issues, right? Parents who are afraid of things happening in schools, you know, white supremacists who are afraid about encroaching immigration and diversity. Uh, people who don't want pregnant people to have control over their bodies. There's a through line and they're weaponizing it. So I think the intersectional approach on their side may have always been there, but as they get more diverse, 
on their side, you're seeing more of these intersectional arguments on their side. They're not just the same monolith that they used to be, and so they're getting more sophisticated, and we have to acknowledge that and fight hand-to-hand -hand combat with them on that. Yeah, and I say, absolutely, they're projecting fear because they are afraid, because the truth is, the horse is out of the stable, the train's on the track, it's moving forward. We're getting more diverse, we're getting younger, browner, they're terrified about what that means. And they are, in particular, there is a insidious way that they are trying to groom our young people, not just make us afraid for our young people's lives, but they're grooming young people into this kind of bigotry. But it's not, the hopeful thing is, I'd like to always come back to that, is that it's not the majority. It still isn't. They're working incredibly hard. Yes, is it disturbing? But we can meet that. And when I'm traveling around the country, again, this is why it's so important for our young leaders, we give them their space and the power. We just, I just came from um, Denver over the weekend for a um, campaign school basically called Demand a Seat. We do it for our volunteers because we know in order to change, we gotta build the bench with leaders that understand, that have the lived experience, that are going to legislate policy, that is going to impact and save lives across the board on every issue. And we did our first one for young leaders. And we had 40, it's a pilot, we have 40 from across the country and they are ready to go. So we've got to make sure that we're empowering our young people because that's what they're coming for. And remember, they're afraid of us. So let's, let's, let's live into that. Let's continue to do the work let's live in. and fight back. I love it, I love it. So I do want to go back to unity as part of intersectionality. So, and I'm going to give you an example. When you look at the books being banned across this country, very small number of people getting them banned. Not a majority. Back to the point about power, majority of this country agrees with all of us in this room that we should have the freedom to learn, that it is good to learn each other's histories, that it is appropriate and good that we learn together, that we have gun control and that we're safe from gun violence, that we be able to make choices about who we are in our own bodies. But here's the thing, when you look at the book bans, what do you think is being banned? 80% of the books being banned fall into two categories. The content is about LGBTQ identity or experience, or both, or the protagonist of the book is a person of color. What does that tell you? It tells you exactly the point that Minnie is making. I'm just, I'm just reinforcing it, right? The division that they are trying to d create is a division that says, we don't belong. And the we includes all of us. And if you track the money, the money that is banning abortion, the money that is bringing lawsuits like 303 Creative, where you got somebody ain't even been asked to be served, serve anybody who's LGBTQ and yet suddenly has standing to say, I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it will hurt me so deeply to do a website for them. Like crush my, my whole identity and belief system. Right. Yeah. Huh? Right. Guess where that, from a civil rights standpoint, Guess where we got the precedent that said you can't discriminate in your private business? Black folks. So when they come for 303 Creative to say, yeah, you can be protected from serving people who shouldn't have served, 
they're coming for us too. That's right. That's right. And if they come, and I, when I did the speech, right, at New College in Florida, where the majority of those kids are out, are trans, are demanding a curriculum that is diverse. That those, when those students stood up to the governor telling them they couldn't have gender studies, telling them they couldn't have a president that believed that they should be who they wanted to be and that they should have to learn business, they stood up but the students at FAMU, the historically black college and university, was also being told they couldn't say slavery mm. in history curriculum. But what does that tell you? What it tells you are two things. It's all of us, and that's the unity part. Leadership right. Conference, Civil and Human Rights. That's right. Sorry, y'all. This is all of us. But it also tells you that they're trying to make sure anybody else sees themselves on the other side of a fence and that if they want to be able to protect their freedoms they have to stand against ours but this is the point most people don't agree and the power the power that angela is talking about is when we talk about 13 uh, 18 to 35 year olds 18 to 35 year olds the most diverse Generations in the history of the country are between age 13, uh, 18 and, th and 35. But it's also the population that says that's going to be a third of the electorate, a third very soon. And that third, guess what? They think you should be able to decide what your own gender identity is. They think whether they're cis or not, they think that you have no business saying who should marry whom or who has to even have uh, make a decision about how they have reproductive choice and they all think there shouldn't be guns flowing in the streets. That's right. That's right. Which is exactly why they are trying to take away That's our right. right to vote. It's exactly why they're trying to suppress the vote. It's exactly why. But all I'm saying to you and it's really just making the points we've already heard, is when we stand together is when we win. When we recognize they're not coming for us because we don't have power, they're coming for us because we Come do. On. Come on, that's it right there. That's it right there. You need me to fan you off a little bit? Come on now. Ha! Yeah, open that water. Yes. Well. I love it, I love it. And that's the energy in rooms like this because we start to realize, uh-oh, that's what they're afraid of, how powerful we are when we are working together. So tell me a little bit, because I also think, you know, you follow the money and you see it's the same scary boogeyman, Alliance Defending Freedom, right? That backed the 303 creative case and backed the Dobbs case. You follow the money, you see it's the same groups that are pushing the anti-LGBTQ plus bills in states and the bills to keep us less safe from guns and firearms, right? It's the same folks time after time. I think that people are wondering how do we get to the other side? There's a lot of hope, but tell me a little bit about what strategies you're employing to help to get us to the other side. So we spend a lot of time educating lawmakers, policymakers, the general public about the dark money, about the disinformation and the misinformation, and the root cause analysis of all of this to Maya's point, which is the threats to our democracy. We were one of the first reproductive rights groups to come out for court expansion, right? We've been deep in the work, thank you, and to impeach Clarence Thomas. And, and, <laughs> and I was with some donors last week and they were like, Minnie isn't that far-fetched. I mean, I don't know. Democratic norms, respect for democratic norms. The other side has no respect for democratic norms. And one of the things I want to lean into, so we're out here educating the press, the public about 
the continuum between the dark money, the stacked court, the extremists, how one crazy judge in Texas is undermining your rights, your rights, my rights, medication, abortion. But we have to be a lot more willing to rumble in the streets, punch a Nazi out. Sorry, not sorry. That's what we got to do, right? So, and that's what our young people want to see us do, by the way. They want us to see be bigger, bolder, more aggressive. So I like your point. We know they're afraid. Give them something to be afraid about. Come on now. Let them flinch a little bit, yeah. right? Little Why are we so, right? Right? Why are we so worried about civility? Why are we so worried? And God bless, I love our U.S. Democratic senators. But we're very concerned about protocols on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I love them. But it's time to get aggressive. Get rid of the filibuster. Do what we have to do. So to me, what we're doing differently, those are the things we've been doing, is investing inspired by your organization in our grassroots army. We have four million members. We need to increase that number and we need to move those members from writing the occasional letter and email to being out in the streets in their purple and orange shirts, fired up, showing up, showing out. So that's what we're investing in this cycle. Okay. Yeah, I love that. I love grassroots armies. Um, I think yes, absolutely. One of the things that we have to consider also is if we want to see liberation, like you said, my dear friend Kelly, we cannot use the, the tools of status quo. And so it's kind of to your point, we've got to start looking outside of the box, testing things. And I'm going to go back to this running for office. Now, not everybody wants to do that. That's okay. But there's so many people. Now, you're going to have your army of grassroots. I have mine. We're going to get them together. You start... You start with the grassroots, you move them up the ladder, and you say, hey, and this is what was happening with our grassroots. They're advocating, advocating for good policy. They're going to school board meetings, they're going to the state house, and they're like, these people are not writing good policy. What are they doing? They are not helping me. I can write good policy. So then we're building the bench, we're training and running them for office, and then we're gonna have champions in office. And two examples, are in Minnesota, where six of our own volunteers were elected last cycle, and we passed amazing gun sense legislation. Michigan, nine, nine of our own grassroots got elected, and we had a trifecta with the governor, the, both the, the houses, and we're passing incredible gun sense legislation. So it's possible, we see it in Colorado, we see it in Illinois, and Maryland, and we're gonna keep going. So I think that's really important. And also we have to start thinking the cultural side of things, laws and policies and elections that absolutely have consequences. We're gonna keep working on that. But we gotta start thinking the long game because our opposition has had decades this isn't overnight. They didn't just wake up and have power. They've been building this in secret, and now it's not so secret. And we need to start thinking about the cultural change that we want to see in this world and investing in that long-term strategy and doing it collectively, because that is what's going to get us to the other side. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And Maya, I gotta ask you, the Leadership Conference does so much regarding our strategies around protecting democracy and also looking at AI as an emergent threat. I would love to hear more about how you're thinking about those strategies to get us to the other side. All right. I'm gonna try to be really brief. Um, although it's a very complicated subject, but I just wanna boil it down to this. Technology, we're in a paradigm shift moment. It's, and it, it's a paradigm shift. Technology is paradigm shift. But what technology is doing is building off of what we already built. Which means if we built racism, it can build more. If we build exclusion, it can build more. If it builds disinformation, it builds more, right? So part of what we have to do is understand that really what's happening with artificial intelligence, for example, and we're looking at it very much, not just long-term, but also in this election cycle, is it, it's, it has the ability to ensure that things like the big lie 
continues to be not just a dominant narrative, but actually serves to continue to undermine belief in the outcome of our elections, but also to endanger the lives of people, whether they're poll workers or whether they're just voters trying to get up and show up to vote. We're even seeing, just like we're seeing criminalization of reproductive health, we're seeing criminalization of voting. It's really the same thing, but here's the opportunity. The opportunity is for us, as we're thinking about building power, and I'm gonna go back to that 18 and 35. 18 to 35, kids of color, I call, I'm, I'm old, so if you're 35, you're a child to me. Um, it, but you know, young people, 18 to 35, in communities of color, in swing states, in swing states, if we activated in just 11 of those states that we're looking at, four, we, we think we could get 4.5 million more people voting. They're already registered, they just don't necessarily vote. But we have to also create the ability for them to help their communities distinguish between the deep fake, between the text, between the where the sources of information come from that are legitimate versus illegitimate. Because what they can do is suppress votes just by having it swim in lies like where you show up to vote, who can vote, how you can vote, and they can use these tools to advance it. But we have every ability to start to educate in our communities and for the people who, if they show up, they make the difference, but they're also the people who help the grandmamas vote. They're the folks that help everyone in their community understand how to do it. And that kind of power building is also about ensuring that they're able to weigh in on guns, that they're way able to weigh in on being able to learn what they want to learn in schools, read the books they want to learn, and all of that really is fundamental to helping understand that technology is not is neutral, but people are not. So making sure that our people know how to distinguish and to activate, and that's what we're doing. Mm, mm, mm. You know, one of the things that's been on my mind is this concept of power. And I think for me, you know, Angela, me and you came up, we had a perm, you remember. We did have a perm, I remember that. <laughs> Back in the day when we were baby <laughs> organizers out here. Yes. Um, and we used to talk about power all the time. And I think sometimes when we're talking about power in the world, it can be contorted because of the ways that use, people use power to corrupt, right, and dismantle versus power to give our folks right. the types of rights and equity that they deserve. When you're thinking about power in this moment, what do we need to do to build more of it and get comfortable with being a little yes. power hungry in service oh, yes. of our people? Power hungry. Maya, I see something. I see something. So I, 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 want, I want to say we have to talk differently about our power. We spend so much time. Y'all, we got to critique as long as the day. And I know I got as long as the year. But one of the things, the difference, and I, I keep going to 18 to 35 because that's the future, but it's also our power base for all the things we care about. We see them as undervoting. The, let's be honest, we got excited in the midterms, right? We got excited because where we got like a trifecta in Michigan yeah. or, you know, at any of the places beating back the trifecta in Wisconsin, it was because 18 to 35 showed up in greater numbers, second largest in the history of the country. Second largest. Okay, but ask, yeah, 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 go ahead. Ask me how many showed up. 31%. Mm. And we got excited. The, our, our voting rates are 56%. What if they actually understood the difference between showing up and not showing up is the difference between you get to marry whoever the goddamn hell you want. Mm -hmm. what, if you what if we say the difference between you showing up and not showing up is whether you get to read the damn book they told you they don't want to have in the school. What if you actually said the difference between you showing up or not showing up because you have the power, because you have the numbers, and you can tell all us old damn people what to do. 
And I'm going to tell you, my, <laughs> I got a 19-year-old and 22-year-old. Works when I say it to them. <laughs> but it's the difference is we're telling them what their power is, not what their problem is. That's, That's right. right. That's right. 100%. And I will lean right on that. First of all, take all those notes. Those are your, all your talking points you just got today. Thank you so much, Maya, for that. But now that they know their power, we need to understand that we have power together. It's not power over. It's not like we have, you know, like the Wiz or Wizard of Oz be the, up, up there and we're waiting for somebody to bestow something on us or Superman to come. We are power together. And that's why the collaboration, the, making sure that we're connecting the dots and the intersections of all of this is incredibly important. One thing that we did in the gun violence prevention movement is with power with, by the way, the majority of the country in every single poll, sideways, upside and down, even Fox News put out polls. The woman was reading them and she said, oh my goodness, because it was exactly what we've been telling you. Exactly what we've been telling you. We worked hard with this administration that's been the strongest on gun sense in our history, by the way. And we've gotten so many things through executive orders, but they just established the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. And while we love the President and the Vice President, it is not because they just woke up and said, let's just do this today. It's because the people and the power were pushing and demanding action when it comes to gun violence in this country. And it, show, it happens. So we got to get them out. We got to talk to them the way and meet them where they are and have their peers talk to them. And we got to keep moving that energy and let folks know that we are the power. And it doesn't just, uh, it doesn't end when you vote. When you go to the ballot box, that's just the beginning. Yes. We hold them to account and we demand what we need and we show up and if we don't like it, they can go and we can bring other people because we're building the bench that will step up and do the job. Ooh, come on, yeah. So post jobs, we hear all the horror stories, but there's actually a lot of big wins. So one of my jobs when I'm talking to our members and our supporters and in the press is to get really aggressive about how winning abortion is. When abortion is on the ballot, abortion wins. Yes. Full stop. 100%. When we go directly to the people, we win every time. That's why they keep trying to change the rules like they did in Ohio and they're gonna keep trying to change it. That's why all these candidates in Virginia are running around talking about 15 week compromises when we know that's just a ban, an abortion ban, and they know they can't win. So we have to be more audacious about the fact that we are the majority, eight out of 10 Americans are with us, that includes independents and a growing number of Republicans. We are winning over and over again, and our supporters need to feel that winning energy. It's part of taking back the power. It's, yes. a, it's a thematic to what we've all been saying. We have to feel like, don't mess with us. We are the winning side. You need us to win. And I'll just say it, you know, we get the girl money most of the time, but I've been like, I need some of that boy money too because we're gonna win in 2024 on abortion. Yes. So I'd like to see some intersectional uh, development opportunities too, I'll just say that. But often we get the, oh, well, you're the people of color groups or the civil rights groups yeah. or the special, the constituencies. Yes. Uh, we are not treated like we're the majority, but the majority is with us and we are the most persuadable to the majority. So we just got to own that power. Yes, yes, Minnie, yes. And that resonates with me, because people don't know this, but for the LGBTQ plus movement, less than 1% of traditional progressive funding is going to our causes. But at the same time, when you look at all of our organizations, who's standing on the front line to defend this democracy? It's us. It's women, it's people of color, it's non-binary folks, it's LGBTQ plus folks. It is us. They need us more than we need them, and it's time to show them. Absolutely. Right. I'm ready. I also want to say, 
there's something also that's different in the movement. I think that if we looked back five years ago, 10 years ago, the melanin on this stage wouldn't be as popping as it is on tonight. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes. But tell me, what does that mean for us? That not only are our people changing, but the leadership of our movements is as well. Why is she looking at me? Because <laughs> I know you had a word on your heart. <laughs> I did not want to start the answer to this oh, one. Good. Well, because it's complicated, right? And, and, and I think sometimes we have to do some truth telling. Yes. Yeah. It is yeah. complicated. So it's both a wonderful thing um, but we've also watched money get harder. Mm. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. She, she said boy money. Boy money. There are a few other things I could have said. White money. Um, and, and I think we have to be on. <laughs> I, I didn't say it. I said it. Um, and I don't mean that in the, because we get a lot of wonderful support and we're always really grateful. And I think to the point about you know, there's a way we do unity that is extremely important and valuable. And I couldn't make it through the day if I didn't have sisters like this to do it with. And also the brothers who are very much um, extremely supportive uh, and uh, part of our coalition. Um, but I, but I'm, the only reason I say that is because it would be not truthful to suggest that it wasn't hard that you didn't get the pat on the head treatment, that there wasn't a little bit more extra stuff you have to prove to demonstrate that you can get it done, even as you're getting thanked for saving it. And I don't say that actually as a way to be, it only gives me much, much, much more encouragement uh, who was it, which, uh, uh, you know, when Coco Graff said, thank you to all of those who doubted me. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Because it does, it does create the reminder of what it means to demonstrate to this country who adds value and how we add it and how all of us add it. Because I don't even want anybody by the way, including white men, to feel like they don't have value. Because it's actually not the way I feel or what I believe. And it, it, it really creates the opportunity to demonstrate and to model, no matter what you think of me, I will see your value That's right. and demonstrate to you how to see mine. 100%. All those things co-sign, and I would just add, you know, I'm always adding a little hope. Um, the good news also is that this means strategies are centering lived experiences of people because we can go to any part of any of the movements that we're leading and know what disproportionate impact means. Who is it? It's always the same. It doesn't matter what issue area. I've worked in many. I was in reproductive justice. I was in immigrant rights. And here I am now. And it's the same disproportionate impact. And so what does that mean? That our strategies have to center the people most impacted. And so when you see more folks leading, that gives us an opportunity to be at the table and not on the menu. So that's exciting to me, but it doesn't mean that it's not difficult. It doesn't mean that it doesn't come with, with things that are, again, that's not difficult and that we're not working 10 times harder sometimes, all the time. Um, but we're here and that's important and we're gonna keep making sure that we have pathways for more people that are impacted by all the things that we care about to show up and not just show up in a way that is tokenizing, but to be leading, to be driving the strategy. Because again, that's when we're gonna all be liberated, when we have the folks most impacted driving the strategy. So here we are. I love that. So. I am the first person of color, woman of color, immigrant to run my organization. My organization was, up until a few weeks ago, called NARAL Pro-Choice America. 
and we made a big change to rebrand to reproductive freedom for all. And that was, thank you, I will 100% credit to my white predecessor and my majority white board of directors that said, we need a roadmap to equity. They laid it out many years ago. It was why I was attracted to even come. Yeah. They made the hard choices to make financial and structural and strategic commitments to shift the way we do the work, in part because of a values-based conversation, but also because we need to win. Yeah. And we know we can't win without the for all, right. period. So it's not if we position everything as values as aspirational, like, well, we should have women of color leading these orgs. Okay, but how do we change the work? And to your point, we know that if we center those most affected by abortion bans, people of color, young people, 18 to 35, we are augmenting the already powerful coalition that's predominantly white with the winning margin and the energy to fuel the future of the movement. So it's a strategic change. I don't want anybody to think that any of us are here out of a values aspirational goal by our boards of directors and our donors. We're here because we know how to win. That's right, that's right. And I know you know that, but I just want to underscore that. Underscore it, underscore, that's right. Underscore, underline, highlight, but also because we were given a mandate to do the work differently. Because especially for our movement, post Dobbs, if we're doing things the same, we are committing malpractice. That's right. We're in a five alarm fire. We have to do things differently. So it starts with leadership, but it's also about who's in the field, who's leading those operations in the states, how are we making decisions. And the other thing I'll say is, I want to caution folks that just because we're here, things don't magically change in our movements. The hard work of equity and inclusion includes all of us, particularly those of us who are not people of color, and it's going to be uncomfortable sometimes, and hard truths like the ones we're sharing will have to be said. But I am, again, pathologically optimistic that we're going to get there. I love that. I love it. I love it. Can we it. just name one yes. thing, to Kelly? Um, because we're also, while we're seeing a lot more, a lot more women of color in leadership positions, I think we know, and I think we have to say, until we see trans people of color in leadership yes. roles, yes. we have not achieved. We've made progress, but we have not achieved. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can say that again, underscore it, underline it, highlight it, bold it, and italicize it too. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, you know, I'll say this. Um, you know, for me, when, uh, I'm gonna bring him up, Donald Trump was elected in 2020. Too soon, um, too soon. I know, it's too soon, it's too soon. But we, we gotta remember so we make sure it doesn't happen yeah, again. Yeah, right, okay? that's right. But when he was elected, I remember I was catching a lot of tears and people were like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in the United States of America's history. And I was like, well, I mean, it's bad, but <laughs> I can think of one worse thing. Genocide, like there's we were internment we were camps. There's a lot of bad stuff. And I say that because it reminded me part of the reason why leadership mattered is it's not just about leading in the moment, it's about understanding enough about how we got to that moment to re-envision what a future could be. That's right. We have to be able to hold both. Yes. And I think there's something forward-looking about the way that in this moment that women of color and folks of color are leading organizations that's allowing us to hold the complexity of the past, find joy in the moment that we're in, and still be fervently fighting for something our ancestors told us was our birthright. Yes. So I'm, I'm excited about us, I'm excited about our leadership, I'm excited and hopeful about this moment. Um, and I'm also just proud to be in movement with all of you. I love y'all really to my core, um, and I know that that love is also what allows us to challenge and push one another in the ways that our people need. So our time on this panel is wrapping up. The Red Table Talk is about to end. But before we go, is there any final message you want to share with our folks who are in the audience? You said hope. 
you said hope. I forgot what you said, but I think there was a curse word. Oh, no, that was me. Um, uh, I've dropped a lot more F-bombs since 2016. Um, so I, I will say this, because I think it's so important. What is hope? If it's accurately defined, in my view, hope is the passion for what is possible. And the reason I say it that way is, and I think we know this as women of color, I think we know this as people who've had to fight for identity, who've had to fight to be seen as having value, it's, it is our passion for what is possible for this nation to be that is the hope. It is not inevitable. The hope comes from our passion for that possibility. And I just want to agree that that means, and my passion for that possibility comes from everyone in this room, because you showed up. I mean, what do I say after that? I don't know. I, I definitely agree. And I would say, you know, we got to keep pushing. And it's OK. One thing that's really important, especially as I stepped into this role, I'll say is that we don't have to save the world on our own shoulders alone. It's one lesson we have to learn. There are so many of us across this country that want to see better and want to do better. And we can help them to get there. And if you need to take a step back, that's OK, too. We're going to keep moving forward together, and we got to make sure that we're doing this collectively and collaborating and intersectionally and making sure the most uh, disproportionately impacted are centered. And I believe, I am hopeful, I'm fervently hopeful that we're going to do this together because it's, it's, it's going, it's going there, and we're just going to keep moving forward. So I feel good. I feel good. Yeah. Um, Kelly, I love you too. But in all seriousness, you know you have what you have here, right? I don't know if they know. <laughs> you have Seriously. one of the most significant rock stars of the entire progressive movement. That's no, right. you need your, 100%. we need to say that. And we need to say that. And this is important because as I was growing up as a young activist, um, and I went to college, I remember first seeing the iconic HRC logo being like, what does that mean? I see it everywhere. All the cool people have it on their car. I need to know. <laughs> I remember joining. I was a member. I was a standing member as a young professional. I may not be anymore. I'll, we'll work that out later at backstage. <laughs> this is an iconic brand. You are an iconic group of people and activists and movement leaders in this room. You are fueling an organization that has so profoundly shifted the perception and the rights of LGBTQ plus people in this country. It's an honor to be here with you. And I'm just moved that Kelly is your president. Say that. No, really. It's a big, as Joe Biden would say, yeah. it's a big effing deal. Big effing deal. Absolutely. There was a whole happy dance in the coalition when y'all did this. Yes. All kinds that. of celebrations. Yes. All kinds of happy yes. dance. So I just want to say thank you, but also just feel it in your bones for a minute how powerful and important HRC is, and you are as part of it. I feel it. That's I right. want you to feel it. Yes. Sit with it. Well, that's a whole world word to end this panel on. Let's give it up for them one more time. Give them that HRC love. Thank you so much to Maya, to Angela, to Minnie for coming out with us tonight. Yes, y'all, we got some work, but we're gonna get free.